Praise God. It's a privilege to be before you tonight, uh, ministering with Pastor or Bishop Gaunt, ministering elsewhere tonight, but it's a privilege. Um, just in case, I, ha uh, I have, just in case, I welcome everybody online, and cousin, if you're watching, hi, cuz. Uh, she might be tuning in tonight. I'm supposed to get get to see her tomorrow, so I'm excited about that. So we're going to be going to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 14 through 19. I guess this is kind of continuing a theme I've been on, just kind of trying to expose the devil a little bit more. And then I'm going to do my job to just let God do what he wants and get on my way so Pastor Smet can finish what God wants to do in this service. Genesis 1, 14 through 19, and then I'll be reading 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. But it, verse 14 says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give, up, give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God sent them in, set them in the firmament in the, of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And then turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And it reads, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Will you pray with me? Jesus, God, I pray right now for this service. I pray, God, that you would just have your way, Lord. Jesus, you take control. You have your way. I empty myself right now, God so that you can do what you want to do and accomplish through me for my role that's in this service, God, today. Jesus, touch our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to receive it today, God, whether we're here or we're online, Lord Jesus. We give you full permission to do whatever you want, to interrupt the service at any point of time, God. I pray for that, God, and I'll give you all the glory, and we praise you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, for those who might be familiar, and for those who are not familiar, of course, this is this port. The first portion of Scripture is dealing with creation, and it's the fourth day of creation, and that is the day that God said, "Hey, let there be lights in the firmament." So, you know what? They can set their clocks now. They can they can have calendars now. They know the seasons in that because I'm putting these lights up in the, in the heavens. And, and, he, and he said, let there be a great light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night. And he saw that it was good. The moon, I don't know if you've seen it lately, the la last week, I know earlier this week, it just was beautiful. It was like the first the little sliver moon and then grew into the crescent moon. It was just gorgeous with all the clear nights we've had. But the moon has no power. No power on its own. The moon doesn't produce heat. It's a cold, lifeless body orbiting the earth. Round and round every month it goes around the earth. The sun, vice versa, has immense power. The sun produces fervent heat that, as far as I know, anything that comes near it will be vaporized with the heat. The moon does not produce light. It can only reflect the light that shines on it. You can stare at it all night long, 
and you're just fine. Your eyes are fine. You can look elsewhere. It, no, no harm done. The sun, on the opposite side of that, is intensely bright. And if you st stare directly at it for just moments, you could have permanent eye damage. You need special ways to look at the sun directly. Special lenses or little holes in little things or special glasses that are, I think are probably equivalent to a welding grade, you know, for darkness. The comparison between the sun and the moon is a perfect example of the difference between Jesus, who is God and has all power, and Satan, who is a fallen angel and can only do what he's allowed to do. They are opposites. That's why I've titled it, Opposites. Jesus is all good. Satan is all evil. He's all bad. They are opposites, but not as Satan. It's not like Satan is the equivalent to God, but just on the opposite side of the, the equation. He is not that. He may be the opposite side of God, because God is good and Satan is not, but he has no power, no authority, unless it's given to him. Ask Job. Satan's walking around heaven. God goes, what you up to? Oh, just, just walking to and fro. Have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him. He's a godly man. He's a righteous man. He prays. He's awesome. Hmm. You take your hands away from him, he'll curse you. Hmm. God knew he wouldn't. Go. Go ahead, Satan. God gave him permission. You know another way that Satan gets power? We give it to him. Jesus is everything good. Satan is everything bad. In second, I, I read the second portion of scriptures in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, but this time I'll read verse 15. And it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to the works. You hear that? Satan can appear like an angel of light, but he also has ministers that can appear, fall, other fallen angels that can be transformed into the appearance of being ministers of righteousness. For example, lay on hands, lay on hands. That is a biblical pr principle. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's biblical. They laid hands throughout the New Testament on people. They're praying for them. It's in the Bible. But there's also false ministers out there who appear to be ministers of righteousness. False faith healers, TV evangelists, whatever, who basically through their ministry that Satan is really behind, has made a mockery of laying on a hand so that people say, well, those, those, those people are fake. And so when they come into a house or a church or come across people who are real people of God, who, and then they see them lay on their hands, and all of a sudden they go, oh, wait a second. They're turned off by it because Satan has spoiled something that God has for good. Because Satan is opposite, and he tries to mimic or destroy what God has set up for godly purposes. For instance, tongues. That's the King James word, but it means I'm not speaking in an unknown language to you. It is biblical. God's, it's God's heavenly language that he gives to people as he fills them with the Spirit of God, with the baptism of the Holy Ghost or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it's the only evidence that's given at the initial time. It's there. It's biblical. 
It's also used in the gifts of the Spirit, but it's a different word for that tongue. So often some people confuse it with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, the evidence of being filled with the Spirit. They confuse it with the gift of the Spirit when you speak in diverse kinds of tongues. It's not the same. It's still God that's given the ability, but one... You know, he said he, he, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, they give, set these, all these guidelines and that for how the gifts should be operated. It is for a purpose, for the edifying of the church. The other one, it's our prayer language. Because after you get the Holy Ghost, you can pray, speak in tongues as a prayer language to God, and it's biblical. But Satan, or one of his fallen angels, if he has someone possessed, can cause someone to speak in what appears to be tongues. That happened to our Bishop Betcher. He was praying for someone that he started hearing this, this, these tongues, and then he heard another voice from God that said, that's not me. So the devil can do it, and then you got crazies out there that like sit there and say, hey, we'll teach you how to speak in tongues making a mockery of something that is so very real. I didn't believe it all my life, but I experienced it for myself, so I'm a big believer. I know it's true. But the devil tries to, again, to destroy what something God has set up. Another example. Noah. God gave Noah and mankind a promise. And he sealed that promise with a sign of that promise. A reminder that every time he's not going to flood the earth. But this world, through Satan, has taken that sign and desecrated it. To the point where I don't even want my kids drawing it because I don't want anybody to think that we're supporting something that we're not supporting. But it is a reminder that God said he will never flood the earth again. And so he gave it to us as a sign. But Satan is trying to destroy it. Worship and music. S Satan was the choir director. I've mentioned this before. He's the choir director and he he lost his job. He got booted. He got canned. He was fired. No severance pay. Worship with anointed godly music is a powerful thing. Powerful thing. It draws us into the presence of God. It can stir godly hunger and desire. can create just awe. It can defeat our enemies without us even having to really fight. All we have to do sometimes is just worship. And when we worship, God fights the battle for us. That's real worship. That's real music. But Satan uses music too to deceive billions through lyrics and seductive, uh, seductive beats stuff that even creates people to worship the ones who are singing or performing. And again, when I said, you know, it can transform his minister, uh, transform people into ministers of righteousness, even though they're not, it can even happen under the disguise of Christian music. Slap a lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. Satan will just try to deceive, saying, hey, look at this is a Christian band. And they're up there, but they don't know truth. They don't know how it really takes to get to heaven. And some of them are living just as ungodly as some other heavy metal rap band, whatever you want to call it, genre out there. They're just living just as sinful as, as the world. Satan is simply the king of cheap imitations. In 1 uh, Peter 5.8, it says, Be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, I know we usually say we need to beware, because he's, he's looking to get at us. 
But I want to focus that he, he's going around like a roaring, roaring lion. He again is imitating God, who in Revelations 5.5, 5, it says about Jesus, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So anytime Satan goes around trying to be a roaring lion, he's just being a cheap imitation of Jesus Christ. But though Satan seeks to destroy, Jesus brings life. He's a lion that comes to save. There's opposites. Jesus is truth. Satan is a, do you remember Elder Manley's sermon? Satan is a liar. That's right. I had this weeks ago, Elder Manley, okay? <laughs> Uh, John 8, 44, he, he mentioned this verse on Sunday. Uh, it says, Ye are, the, are of your father the devil, in the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. But in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Satan cannot tell the truth. Jesus cannot tell a lie. If it's in God's word, it's true. If God speaks a promise to you, it is true. Doesn't matter what Satan says, who's a liar, he's lying. What Jesus says is true. If something was not true and Jesus spoke it, it just became true. If he says gravity will not cause you to fall down, all of a sudden you're going to be able to walk on air. Because he said it. And when he comes back for his bride someday, we will walk on air. Jesus, Satan came to destroy, but Jesus came to bring life. In John 10, 10, says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Satan, now he doesn't come and just reveal himself and say, Hi, I'm the devil. You want to go to a party with me? No, he doesn't. He is sneaky. And he will try to lure you, seduce you into doing something that's not of God. He leads you in a path that leads to destruction, whether it's drugs or alcohol, riotous living, whatever it may be, ungodly living. The end is death destruction. But Jesus came that we might have life. Satan brings loss, but Jesus brings victory. He brings life through Calvary where he hung on the cross for our sins. <laughs> Satan says you're all alone. But the word says in Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When Satan is through with us or with someone, he leaves them. He has done what he set out to do. But Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. We may try to walk away, but he's not going to walk away from us. <laughs> the devil says it's impossible. But Jesus says in his word, Matthew 19, 26, But Jesus beheld him and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You're looking at those situations in your life. You're looking at individuals in your life where you, you so badly want them to be saved. And it looks impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He can make a way where there seems to be no way. Just ask Moses and the children of Israel when they stood in front of the sea. 
And God said, lift up that rod. And he parted the Red Sea and they crossed on dry ground. He made a way where there seemed to be no way. The devil says, God does not love you. But the word says in 835, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I am, pers in verse 38, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even Satan himself can separate us from the love of God. He loves us. While we are yet sinners, he died for us, the word of God says. Don't believe the, Lord, the devil because he is a liar. Jesus loves us. The devil says, God doesn't know who you are or care about you. But in Matthew 10, it says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, you are more of more value than any sparrows. I'm going to end it there on that scripture there. So he said, the devil will say, God doesn't know you. He doesn't know where you're at. No, he even knows the hair. The, Jesus even knows the number of hairs on your head. And for some of us, that's more than others. But he knows that. And it says, aren't you more worth? You think I'm of no worth, of no value. But he says, you are worth than it more than any sparrow or group of sparrows. You're worth than any more rare, ex almost extinct creature or bird out there. You are more precious than that. Don't believe the devil when he says, God doesn't care about you. It is a lie. Jesus cares for you. He loves you. He wouldn't have died for you if he didn't. <laughs> Satan brings back things back up to condemn, saying, you're always going to be the way you were. You're just going to be the same old, same old. But Jesus says in his word in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and I got close. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yeah, I may once was a drunk, but I'm not now. Yeah, I may have went into the bars getting drunk and doing this stupid things, but not anymore because I'm a new creature. I am a new being through Jesus Christ who saved me. But God will never, Satan goes, God will never forgive you. But in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in Psalms 103, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. That's Jesus Christ. He will forgive you. I don't care what you did. Jesus will forgive you. And many of us, we, God, need to get that revelation that he already forgave me. I don't need to dwell on that anymore. I don't need to let the devil bring that back up. It is buried under the blood in the name of Jesus Christ. Hmm. And I end with this. In first Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, We'll perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. God's going to finish what he started in you. Just keep coming, keep yielding your lives to him, and he'll keep molding you, shaping you into a godly image, making you into his image. So again, remember, Satan is a liar. Jesus speaks all truth. He is on your side, and you will have victory through him. Thank you, Pastor Stokes. Whew. Those are some things we just need to understand at times. 
That's it. Just let it sink in a minute. It's okay. Now that you're all quiet. Apologize, I didn't get some slides up there, but I'm just going to go ahead and just read a couple scriptures, a a definition, and we'll see where the Lord goes from there. But I'm going to be reading out of the Gospel of John, chapter 12, starting at 24, and I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation. Seems to be my book of choice lately, or my version of choice. And it says, let me make this clear. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops into the ground and dies. Because then it sprouts and produces a great harvest of wheat, all because one grain died. The person who loves his life and pampers himself will miss true life. But the one who detaches his life from this world and abandons himself to me will find true life and enjoy it forever. If you want to be my disciple, follow me, and you will go where I am going. And if you truly follow me as my disciple, the Lord will shower his favor upon you. Some prerequisites in that passage of scripture that I just read. And there are very important prerequisites in that passage of Scripture that I just read. And taking a part of Romans 12 too, something that I've been just going over for the last couple of months, but the first part of that says, be not conformed to this world. And from the complete word study dictionary of the New Testament, it says conformed is to fashion alike, conformed to the same pattern outwardly. In Romans 12, 2, be not conformed, which is in the present imperative. So for all of you grammar majors, you understand what I'm saying there. I had to look it up because I had forgotten all of this stuff. It's been a long time. An expanded reading might read, stop being molded by the external and fleeting fashions of this age or these world systems, but undergo a deep inner change, a metamorphia or metamorphosis by the qualitative, not quantitative, but qualitative renewing of your mind. And the writer of this dictionary happened to say such a transformation can be wrought only by the Holy Ghost. So let that sink in a moment. We need to understand that when we come into the kingdom of God, we're conformed, we conform to one world and we're transformed into another of which we need to conform to. The conforming part is entirely up to us. He doesn't say, I'm going to make you do these things. I'm not going to make you do this or that. It is our responsibility as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of him that we choose to be conformed to his world. And sometimes we don't get that. That we don't understand or sometimes grasp that there has to be a change in us. There has to be some kind of transformation in us. And it doesn't happen because of happenstance. It doesn't happen because I'm just going to do my duty, if you will. I come and park my carcass on the pew. I clap my hands. I throw a few bucks in the pan. I I, I raise my hands a little bit, and supposedly transformation is going to come at that point. Now, if you will allow it to be, it can be a part of that process. 
But, but, do we allow that to be a part of the process? And sometimes we just get stuck in the same old, same old, week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year after year. And we walk in one way and we walk out the same way we walked in. And it's no difference in our daily life with God. There are days that we just walk into his presence and we walk out the same way we walked in. Again, it's a choice that we can allow him to mold us and shape us into his image more and more, or we can just walk back out the same way we were when we went into his presence. Those are decisions that we have to make on a daily basis. And the first scripture that I read, it talked about a seed that has to get planted. That seed is us. That seed is us. There is something that we need to do on a continual basis in order to help that process along. If we resist that, the process doesn't happen. And it was interesting. I, I just did a quick read about seeds today because, you know, it was there. And it talked about these different things about a seed in the shell and all that kind of stuff and, you know, all these scientific terms that I didn't bother to memorize because it really wasn't applicable. But one of the things that it talked about when that seed becomes, when it first goes into the ground and it begins to break up, it talks about the force of the swelling causes the seed coat to burst, allowing the radical, which is the embryonic first root, to emerge and anchor the seed. Now, that's what happens when the seed is doing as it's supposed to do. Because for any of you that garden, any of you that do any of that stuff, you will understand that sometimes something just doesn't come up. <laughs> I know I planted something there and nothing there, nothing coming up. And so it goes on to say, it talks about these substances for germination called inhibitors that make a seed wait a year. Or many years, hyphen, if conditions aren't right for plant development. Let that sink in a minute. I just, I just sat back, I leaned back in my chair, and I'm like, ho, oh, ho, whoa. A seed can sit in the ground for years until the right conditions are met. It's like, oh, God, don't let me be that seed. <laughs> don't let me be that seed. And sometimes we continue in our day-to-day -day in that manner, wondering why things have not happened the way we wanted them to happen or how God hasn't used us the way we want him to use us. Because we haven't gone through that process. He's waiting on his children. Am I okay here, gentlemen? That spiritual maturity that doesn't come. That's why I said we can do everything day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and continue and continue, and nothing ever happens, but the seed hasn't been right for development. The conditions haven't been met for that seed to begin to grow. That was powerful to me. And it got me to thinking about laying aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets me. 
God's, as David wrote, God, search me and know me. Bring before me anything that's not like you. How many of us dare to do that on a daily basis when we go into the prayer room? Instead of saying, God, my, this I need, this I need, that needs to be dealt with, that needs to be taken care of. Instead of, oh God, make me right to grow. Our mindset needs to be changed, has been taught for many months now. It really is up to us. God is not going to come to you or I and say, here, let me grow you. But I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Well, you're going to do it anyways. No. Okay. Sit there in the ground, you little seedling. Just sit there. Just sit there. And while you, oh God, and while you're sitting there, I'm going to raise somebody else up to take your place. Until you can determine and figure out that you want to grow as well. Mm. And so we need to begin to rethink that process. Sunday, I'm reminded of what was said Sunday, that there's things that come into our life that we, we blame the devil on, we blame the adversary on, and it has nothing to do with him at all. It is our decisions and choices that we have made that allow those things to happen into our life. And furthermore, God may be allowing them to happen into our life so that we can get to a place for development. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people, the devil's running me through the ringer. And I, and I happen to know some things. I'm like, no, they're not. No, he's not. He's trying to get your attention. I bet that smacked me full in the face. Oh, I'm just trying to get your attention, Jim. Uh, okay, let me go fall on my face for a while, and we'll deal with it there. That Nathan moment, you're the man. It doesn't happen to you. If it doesn't, then there's a problem. We have to be that transparent with him. It's not like he doesn't know anyways. Gee, Jim's down there struggling. Boy, hmm. Boy, I wonder how long I should let him run on that rope. Let me bring some things in the situation that will cause him to take thought and take notice and allow me in, in that quiet moment to say, hey, Jim, It's painful when he does that. It hurts. Because most of all, I've, I know at that point in time that I have let him down. I want to honor my dad. I want to please my dad. And that's a whole other message in and of itself. But as we read in the scripture here, It's going to require something of us to see some kind of harvest. The harvest that he's talking about is not necessarily our growth, personally. But that's so that we can be used to reach other people and bear fruit. God's all about the multiplication process. You know, I shared something with one of the brothers a while back about a picture of what looked to be two of the same kind of plants, but one was a wheat and a tear. They look exactly the same except for the, the wheat kernel that's on them. So when they start growing up together, as the scripture talks about, 
You don't know. That's why the word says, no, leave them alone. Let them grow up together. You figure out the rest of that story. It's not pleasant for the tares. The tares are unproductive plants. That's what they are. I do not want to be a tear. There is darkness and wailing and gnashing of teeth and fire prepared for the tear. Just let that sink in and whatever. But he goes on to say that the person who loves his life and pampers himself will miss true life. Meaning we've got to make some decisions in our life. What do we want? Do we want the kingdom of God or do we want the world? We have a decision to make. Every day we have a decision to make. Every day. That dying to yourself thing is a real thing. Not my will, but thy will, O oh God, is a real thing. It's not, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to pray for God to bless me and bless my endeavor. That may be totally the furthest thing from the will of God at that particular point for your time in life or mine. But that's a process that we need to go to daily, every day. I have to be willing to say, Lord, I don't want this, I don't want this stuff. I don't want it anymore. I had that conversation with him today. Like, God, I, I, if there is anything in my life that is hindering any of this, I don't want it. Take it away from me. I don't want to be unproductive in your kingdom. I get real with God like that. I, I don't really care. Because it's, I have to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. I can't do anything for my brothers and my sisters in that regard. But we have to make a decision. What do we want? And we've heard a lot of messages recently about this, and so I'm not going to necessarily rehash that. And in verse 26, it says, If you want to be my disciple, you have to follow me. And you will go where I am going. Where are you going? Don't worry about it. Just follow me. <laughs> it's like putting blindfold on and just... Following that voice that's out there. And if you truly follow as my disciple, the Father will shower his favor upon you. That means we have to become accustomed to hearing his voice. We've talked about that a lot. Being able to hear his voice. Sister Stokes talked about that when she was leading prayer with her, that lady Anna in her neighborhood. God spoke to her and she prayed with her. But that's Sister Stokes, so... Could be you or 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 me. But she was in tune. She heard. She listened. She has put herself in a position to where she can hear. I will use a testimony that I shared with the, with the team tonight. There was a situation going on over the weekend where some people got badly hurt. Somebody reached out to me, said this was going on. We had prayer Sunday, and then I followed up, or she followed up on Monday or Tuesday, I, I can't remember, but said that things are looking better. And then no surgery is going to be needed, no reconstructive surgery, none of this kind of stuff. And I was sitting in prayer. I was just looking out my window, and I was just talking to God like I always do in the morning. And, I'm, and it just this thought hit me. Miracles aren't just for the one who was healed or delivered. It was for others that others may see. And God quickened in my heart to send that to this person. 
And so I did, and then hours went by, and I'm like, well, <laughs> so much for that. <laughs> and then I got a response back. I'm just going to read it for you. It's a little bit easier if I do that. And this is what was replied back to me. The person said, good morning. I'm a backslider. I received the Holy Ghost in December of 92 and was baptized in 93. And she went on to say a couple things about a Bible study that never happened. If I hadn't listened and had myself in a position there. I don't know. Perhaps God would have raised up another seed to go tell them or go talk to them. And I know this is a little bit of a different tangent, but I want us to understand too that when we hear some things from God, don't think it's strange that he's asking you to say or do something in regards to somebody else. It may be, go over to that person and just say, hey, uh, saw that you're having a bad day. You know, hang in there. It's going to get better today and just give them a smile. It could be that, you know, God just says, puts it in your heart to say, tell that person that blue bunny ice cream is the best. And that person could have been crying out to God if somebody will just say something along those lines. Bishop Dobbs even said that God told him what to wear. And when he was at service, the person, that visitor came in and said, that's what God said I was looking for. As wild and weird as we may think it is. But all of that doesn't come until we've submitted to that process. We have to be willing to get before his face every day and say, Lord, change me. Lord, mold me. Lord, mold me more and more into your image. I don't want people to see me. I want them to see you. And there are some people that will not do that. I was one of them for a while. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Nor did I understand either. That that is part of the process to make me what he wants me to be. Whatever that vessel is, whatever that piece of clay is going to turn out to be after it's gone through the, the molding and the shaping process. It, it, it really is irrelevant to me personally. I don't care what I look like. I don't care. As long as it's his hand molding me, as long as his hand is moving upon me, and his hand is not letting up off of me. But that's harsh, Jim. Yeah. We have to die daily. If we want to be his disciple, we've got to do that. Daily. Daily, 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 we have to do that. Otherwise, we just become that seed that's just sitting in the ground waiting for something to happen. But God, God, I've been faithful. Why aren't you using me? God, I've been doing this and that. Da, 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 da. Why, why aren't anything happening? Why aren't you using me? Because of that. Do you really think he's going to allow that to happen without the process to have taken place first so that he can trust us? We've got to know that what he is saying to us and what he wants us to convey is what he's trying to say. And self has to be out of the way. And that's hard. 
That's very hard. You can go on a, a whole week fast, and then next week you're <laughs> back to the same. And going back to being conformed and about the process of the Holy Ghost. Another reason why we have to be in his presence because that's where he tells us, Jim, this is not like me. I need this to change. I need this to stop. I need you to sit still and let me do something to you. Because that's where the change can occurs. That's where we become more and more conformed from the old life to the new life. But we have to be willing to do that. We have to submit to him doing that to us. Getting ready to wrap it up here. In that definition that I read, it references another passage of Scripture, another verse. And musicians, you can come if you'd like, who's ever doing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, in the Aramaic study Bible, I'm full of all new kinds of things here, <laughs> Aramaic. It's what Jesus spoke. <laughs> but all of us with open faces see the magnificence of the Lord as in a mirror. And we, we are being changed into that likeness from glory to glory as by the Lord, the Spirit. It's not when we get there that we're changed. It's here right now that from victory to victory, from trial to trial, from molding to molding and shaping to shaping, we're becoming more like Him. That's, in part, what His disciple is. There is more to that, and I'm not going to touch that tonight. But if we want to be his disciple, we have to submit to his process. We have to submit to what the teacher is telling us. We have to submit to what the Holy Ghost is speaking into our lives. The problem is many of us aren't deep enough and we can't hear the voice of the Spirit calling out to us. But there's hope. You and I are breathing right now, and we can make a decision where we want to go and what we want to do. So if you want to stand, musicians, you can begin to play. I know this message hasn't resonated with everybody, and that's fine. And some of you are well past this, and you are, you're there. You're doing this on a consistent daily basis. That's fine. Please continue to do so. We need to hear from you and learn from you. Yes, I said that. You don't think that I don't want somebody so deep into God that they can't walk up to me during a church service and say, hey, brother, I have a word for you. Why not? It doesn't have to be just the pastors and the elders. I appreciate them hearing from God and speaking into my life. But the body has to learn to be able to do that. But we have to follow the process. Some of you, under the sound of my voice and online, have just been sitting in the ground. Waiting for the right circumstances to come into your life. But 
they're not going to come into your life because you and I haven't made up our mind to allow it to happen. And when that, that, that radical, I like that word, radical, starts growing down, downwards, it says it spins and goes down and down and down. And it begins to acre and draw in all the moisture and the water, the, the, the prayer and the, and, the, and the fasting and the worshiping and the studying of the Word of God begin to draw that down. And, the, and it begins to shoot up and it begins to get leaves and then it begins to blossom and then it, and then it flowers and then there's seeds. And then there's seeds and your life and my life is touching somebody else's life for the kingdom of God and we begin to reproduce and expand the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. You can keep playing. Didn't mean to interrupt you. And I'm going to read this in one last version, and then I'm going to open the altar up. For those that truly, truly want to be changed. This is from Weist's expanded translation. Now as for us, we all with uncovered face... Reflecting as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, or having our outward expressions changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, according as this change of expression proceeds from the Lord, the Spirit, this outward expression coming from and being truly representative of our Lord. altars are open. If you want to be changed, if you want to walk out of this place different, I invite you to come. This is a commitment. It's not just here at the altar that we're coming to to say, yes, Lord, I want to be different. That means when we go get up tomorrow morning, we do the same. Lord, I submit to you. I surrender to you. I surrender to your plans and your purposes. Use my life, oh God. It's a new start.